Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Salatu salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Qala Allah Ta'ala fi kitabihi al-aziz ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-jim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi ya ayyuhu aladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For the brothers in the back, what's going on? Scared of me? No? Come up. Bismillah. Tafadr. Come. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Yusuf. You got up. You got up. I saw you. I saw you. Come on. Bismillah. Tafadr. Tafadr. <laughs> so last week, we talked about how the situation with the Muslims was getting increasingly worse because now Abu Jahl is seeing that his belligerence and his anger and his oppression isn't stopping people from accepting Islam. And as a matter of fact, people are actually becoming more and more sympathetic to the Muslims. So he starts to come up with ideas to assassinate the Prophet Muhammad to hurt the companions, to try to block the da'wah from happening. But the more he tries, the more successful in the da'wah the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims become. And this is a beautiful lesson for us as we talked last week, how the more extreme the oppression occurs, that means the closer we are to victory. So just remember that as we are seeing the plight of our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. So now we're in about the seventh year of Hijrah. The seventh year, no, sorry, not seventh year of Hijrah, what am I saying? The seventh year of Nubuwa, Nubuwa, the seventh year of Nubuwa, where the Quraysh come up with a plan that the only way this ends is if the Muslims give us the Prophet Muhammad and we kill him. So Abu Jahl and his crew decide that this is the only solution now. No other strategy has worked in the past. No torture, no bribing, no threats, no insults. None of that worked. So they publicly declared in, bra in broad daylight at the Haram that they intend to kill the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Here is a public bounty. Enemy number one to the state. So Abu Talib when he heard this, obviously he became very concerned. So he gathered all of Bani Abdul Muttalib, some of the more immediate relatives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his aunts, his uncles, cousins, nieces, and nephews. And as a part of this, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sat with Abu Talib thinking about what they should do next in order to protect the Muslims and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And so Abu Talib said to the Prophet Sallallahu they did not just attack you. By attacking you, they also attacked our tribe. So he called his people. And he convinced his family to stand by the side of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and everyone gathered to support him, whether they were Muslim or not. And so the only one who continued to stand against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his family was none other than Abu Lahab, right? Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu decided, I don't want anything to do with Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib. I am no longer with them. I am with you guys. I am with the Quraysh that are against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So Abu Lahab, he disengaged himself from his family in order to conspire with the Quraysh against the Muslims. So because of that, he is not going to be affected like the rest of his family members will be. As a matter of fact, one thing that he did is he went to Hind bint Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, the wife of Abu Sufyan. Right? They were a power couple who were against Islam. Right? They were a power couple that were against Islam. But, you know, they actually end up accepting Islam. So Hind hired Wahshi. Wahshi ibn Harb. Right? This is the one who assassinates the Hamza. Uh, the uncle, Hamza an, uncle of the Prophet Muhammad in the Battle of Uhud, right? She is the one who will also later on accept Islam. Now Abu Lahab, she said to Hind, she said to Hind, have you heard where my allegiance lies? I am with Al-Latin al-Uzza 
and I have left the people who oppose Allah and al uzza So Hen replies and says, yes, we have noticed and we will not forget that you have joined us. Right? You will have you know, all the money, all the wealth that you want. Right? You betrayed the Muslims for our gain, you will have everything that you want. Don't worry. And so Abu Lahab, he had no loyalty. He had no decency. He sold out his own family because he wanted power. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the rest of his life as an example of humiliation. Towards the end of his life, he becomes very senile. He suffers a stroke. He loses physical bodily functions. He begins to rot away. He has diseases that causes his body to rot. He had like these hard boils and... Okay, bismillah. So, Abu Lahab, he had, you know, all types of diseases, paralysis, dementia, uh, boils and rashes were covering his body, to the point that his family had to kick him out of his own home. They had to build a shed for him to live in by himself. So they even had to hire a couple servants to look after him and clean up after him. So one day, those servants didn't show up for about a day or two. And Abu Lahab's family members, they argued about which one of them would go deal with Abu Lahab. Nobody wanted to go. None of his family members wanted to go because of how, you know, uh, such a bad state he was in. Nobody wanted to get infected with any diseases or anything like that. So after a day or two, when the servants showed up to work again, they checked on Abu Lahab and they found him dead. And no one wanted to deal with his body, right? And so the stench of his body started to actually make the whole entire city smell. And so then the, 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 the children of Abu Lahab and the family of Abu Lahab decided to finally bury him because, and deal with the body because they couldn't handle the, the humiliation, right? So, but it was def difficult to bury the bodies in Mecca due to tough soil. So they had to find a spot outside of Mecca uh, that was hidden from public view. And that's where they, they dropped the body in a place outside of Mecca, right? In a place called Awali. And before they even found the burial spot, the, 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 the family members and the servants who were going to bury Abu Lahab's body, they heard wild dogs that, were, that roam in that area. And the dogs followed them. And later they tore away at Abu Lahab's body. So because of the betrayal and because of the vile nature of Abu Lahab, the rest of his life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used as an example of those who try to humiliate Allah and His Messenger and they end up being the ones who are humiliated. And one of the initial moments when Abu Lahab started to lose his mind was after he abandoned his family during the boycott. He would be sitting by himself looking into his hand and he would be repeating like over and over again, I don't see anything that Muhammad has given me. I don't see anything that Muhammad has given me. Why would I have to support Muhammad? Why would I have to support Muhammad? He didn't give me anything. And he's like talking to himself. And everybody's like, what, what is going on, right? So anyways, what ended up happening is the Quraysh enacted a boycott against the Muslims, particularly against Bani Abdul Muttalib and Bani Hashim. So not only the Muslims, but also the family members of the Prophet Muhammad and those who are sympathetic to Muslims. We won't marry them. We won't trade with them. We won't buy from them. We won't sell to them. We won't talk to them. And let's see how long this goes and how long we can, we can push them and we're going to cause them to starve to death. So, essentially, Abu Talib said that, you know, they're taking drastic measures. We also have to take drastic measures. There is about to be a full-scale warfare if we don't do something. We don't want to see our forefathers disrespected in this way. We may not agree with the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, but you all know that you love him. So we can't see him dead. We have to protect him. And so they decided to take the Prophet Muhammad Sallam to a place called Shi'b of Abi Talib, which is like a, a section of land, a stretch of valley that uh, was owned by the family of Abdul Muttalib. It's kind of like a ranch outside the city, right? 
So you know how like sometimes people, rich people, you know, bougie people in the suburbs, they'll have their nice home and then they'll have like a cabin for like a getaway on the weekends, right? So think of it like that, right? We got to take them to the cabin. We got to take them to the getaway spot. So they take him there. فَجْتَمَعُوا عَلَى ذَلِكَ مُسْلِمُهُمْ وَكَافِرُهُمْ And so Banu Abdul Muttalib, they, they all agreed to this. They all agreed to this. And this is the only reasonable action to take. And those who believed and also those who had not accepted Islam were willing to put support behind this action. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ فَعَلَهُ حَمِيَّةً Means that some of them that were protecting the Prophet and the Muslims, they did it out of the sake of honor. Right? Out of the sake of protecting their family. But others who were there to protect, they did it out of iman and yaqeen, out of faith and conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regardless of the motivation, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in, his, in His wisdom, made this happen in order for there to be enough people to protect the Prophet Muhammad and the companions. Now, Abu Talib decided this was the safest option to take because he knew that things could go very badly. With the Quraysh actually opening uh, uh, and openly advocating and planning for the death of his nephew, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Quraysh, when they learned that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, is being protected by his family and that Abdul Muttalib's loyalty is with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were rallying behind the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the Quraysh realized that they couldn't just conduct a massacre and a bloodbath against the family of Banu Hashim. So now what do they do? So they decided to do a social boycott of Banu Hashim and more specifically, Banu Abdul Muttalib. None of us will talk to them. None of us will sit with them. None of us will do business with them. None of the family members will marry into their family. We will socially boycott them, cut them off, unless they hand over the Prophet Muhammad for execution. And if they're not willing to do that, then they're dead to us and we're going to smoke them out. So the Quraysh actually wrote these non-negotiable terms down on parchment and hung the pact on a wall inside the Kaaba. And they forced the other tribes of the Quraysh to sign on to this pact. They forced to sign on to this pact. Now, of course, because parchment that hangs outside can be ruined by weather, the Quraysh encased the pact in leather and it was completely sealed and they hung it into the Kaaba. This is important detail for later. So the Muslims realize that the Quraysh are now about to go all out. And they're about to make the Muslims suffer. And the boycott started. Whenever anyone would come outside to sell product to the Quraysh, they would go and they would purchase everything. Right? They would purchase everything so that the Muslims cannot get their hands on the, on the merchandise. Abu Lahab would tell them, do not sell to the Muslims. And if you do, sell at a very high price. And even if you sell at a high price, I will pay more anyways. Right? Look, just like, uh, they, will, they will put billions of dollars to try to harm the Muslims. They will put everything in their power, in their wealth, to spread nasty propaganda against the Muslims. We will, we will send everything. We will send all the taxpayers' money overseas to kill the Muslims if we have to. Whatever the price is, just, just shut them down. And so Muslims faced a lot of difficulty. It was starving. And eventually the sufferings of these people got bigger and bigger and bigger. They had no business going on. They had no means of income. They had no regular supply of food. People were starving. People were dying. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he narrates a story that one day he left to go use the restroom and as he was using the restroom, he found like camel hide. And so he took that camel hide and he washed it off and then he burnt it to the point where it was basically like burnt to a crisp and he crunched it up into little pieces and then put it in some water so that it softens up and then that's what he consumed. And he said, I, 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 one narration says, I don't, even, I don't know what it was that I ate. And another narration says that it was camel hide. But, but he says that, that that small piece of food gave me strength to live for another three days. The, the Sahaba were eating leaves. You know, we're, wallahi, we're literally seeing this right now with our brothers and sisters in Gaza. They're eating leaves. They're making bread out of animal feed. 
just to consume whatever they can to survive. And so the Sahaba, they ate these leaves and they became sick. Babies were dying. You can hear the babies. There's narrations where the people that were inside, the outside of the boycott are saying that they can hear the babies crying from outside of the valley and the babies would suddenly stop crying. What does that mean? They're dying. The babies are dying. Food would not go in and the Muslims cannot go out. The parallels are clear. And you got a bunch of civilians, citizens, who are rushing to block any food from getting in to save those who are starving. And they want to claim innocence. And so Abu Talib lived on very high alert during this time. And the whole reason that he had taken this drastic step was so that Quraysh won't assassinate his nephew Wasallam. But you couldn't put anything past the likes of Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. They will try to create a bloodbath in Mecca. In spite of all the sufferings that Abu Talib witnessed of his own family, he knew that this social isolation was necessary to protect the Muslims and the nephew, his nephew Wasallam. So Abu Talib was a wise man, but he was, he was an old man, he was also a wise man. And he would stand by the head of the Prophet Wasallam while he was sleeping to protect him. If he could not stand, he would instruct his children to stand and protect the Prophet Muhammad But the Prophet Muhammad he himself wasn't sleeping much. He was up all night making dua for his ummah, trying to, 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 to plead for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's going to come. And it's going to come. One narration says that every night before they went to sleep, Abu Talib would make the Prophet Muhammad switch tents so that the Quraysh don't know which tent he's sleeping in in case there was a, a plan to assassinate him that night. So this cousin will stay in Muhammad's tent and he'll stay in your tent tonight and then there will be fixed rotations. Sometimes in the middle of the night he would switch every two or three hours just to make sure that nobody knows which sleeping place he is in. And so this boycott, my brothers and sisters, lasted for three years. Three years. This boycott. Right? Now, how much do you think they believed? Like, look at the conviction that they had. Today, in, in, in our comforts, we get a little threat and we run away. We get a, a small financial threat, we run away. We get a small uh, a threat because of our religion, we run away. But the fact is, signing up for the truth, signing up for the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only correct path that this world can offer. If you sign up for this, you will have challenges in your life. Where if you choose to be a Muslim, people may boycott you. You might not have the same opportunities as everybody else. But then we must make a choice. Right? Something that I, I get questioned, I get questioned a lot is, oh, um, you know, I work for this corporate job and they do like happy hour on Thursdays from like four to six. And I want to go to the happy hour. There's alcohol that's served there, but I want to go because it's a good place to connect and people can get promoted. And this, that's the place where you uh, appeal for your promotion, et cetera, et cetera. Can I go? Habibi, you signed up for this, man. This is the sacrifice. You won't be given the same opportunities. But it doesn't matter. Because the opportunity that you got is paradise. And that's a better opportunity than anything this world can offer. And you were given that opportunity. But it also comes with responsibility. Ma'aya, ma'aya, wallah, ma'aya, shaykh. Zakallah khair, ma'aya. Zakallah khair. Na? Zakallah, ma'aya, 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 zakallah khair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he says, وَلَا تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَا نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعْ مِلَّتَهُمْ That, you know, nobody will be pleased with you until you decide to follow their way. Right? Until you try to decide to follow their way. So, 
If that's the case, then why do we have to be apologetic about our deen? Don't be apologetic. Present Islam. Take it or leave it. Obviously, in a wise, kind, respectful manner. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Be who you want to be. But I'll also be my authentic self. The authentic self that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to be. Not what society wants me to be. And so as Muslims, we need to learn to live with confidence. Because people will fight for their liberties day and night. We should do no less. The Sahaba are fighting with every ounce of their strength to the point where they're eating things they don't even know what it is to survive just for the opportunity to be a Muslim. Because can they just say, I'm not a Muslim anymore and go back to the Quraysh camp? They absolutely could. But then what was the point? The opportunity of paradise is so much greater. So difficulties will come, right? But we can never back away from our deen. When difficulties come, we don't change our names. We don't change our schools. We don't change our clothes. We don't stop going to the masajid. We don't shave off our beards because it's difficult. No. You don't know where the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. You don't know where it is. You don't know where the forces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the only one that knows. And so, it was during this time that Khadija bint Khawailid spent every dollar, radiallahu anha, that she had to take care of the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims. Hakim ibn Hizam, who was the fraternal nephew of Khadija bint Khuwaylid. He was a very prominent man of Quraysh. And he wasn't really included in the boycott because he wasn't an immediate family member of the Prophet Muhammad But still, he empathized greatly with the plight of the Prophet's family during the boycott. So one day, Hakim ibn Hizam had a servant that was with him and they took some food and they went to the Sha'b of Abu Talib to try to deliver the food. Along the way, they run into the worst of worst of men in probably history has ever seen, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl saw them and became furious. Are you trying to take food to these people? Don't you know that they're, they're all guilty of crimes? Even the babies? Even the children, they don't deserve to live because they're Muslim? Don't you know these are the children of darkness? And we're the children of light? So he says, Abu Jahl says to Hakim ibn Hizam, I swear to God that you will not go to them. You will not be able to take any food to them. No food, no water, no light, no electricity, no internet, all of it's cut off. Nothing will go in, nothing will come out. And if you try to take food to them, I will make sure that I humiliate you and ruin you in front of all of Mecca. And I'll send you to live with, the, with those people. So, he tries to reason with Abu Jahl. He says, listen, this belongs to Khadija. I'm not giving her anything. I'm just returning what belongs to her. This is her stuff. And so Abu Jahl continues to scream and continues to threaten. Until a man by the name of Abu Bukhtari passes by. And he says, what's going on? Abu Jahl points and said, this man, he's taking food to Bani Hashim. He's taking food to the traders. And so Abu Bukhtari tried to calm down Abu Jahl. And he said, relax. He's just trying to bring food to his aunt. He's taking her food. Can you chill out? Abu Jahl was not calm. He kept carrying on with the screaming, kept carrying on with his, with his complaints. And, and so Abu Bukhtari got a little bit irritated with Abu Jahl and said, why don't you get out of this man's way? And Abu Jahl yelled, no, I'm not going to let you go. And he reached out and tried to attack the man. And to Abu Bukhtari, he gets in the way so he wouldn't get hurt. And to Abu Jahl then, he tries to hit Abu Bukhtari. However, Abu Bukhtari was a much bigger and stronger man than Abu Jahl. So he pushed Abu Jahl back with ease. Then he saw there was a jawbone of a camel that was on the ground. Abu Bukhtari picks it up and ugh, very satisfyingly cracks it over the head of Abu Jahl. And, you know, it seems like getting hit in the head seems to be a very common theme in the life of Abu Jahl, right? 
There was Hamza radiallahu an, Umar ibn Khattab at 1.2, now Abu Bukhtari. And so by this time, Abu Jahl probably has CTE or something. So Abu Jahl, he falls on the ground and he's bleeding from his head. And Abu Bukhtari, he doesn't stop there. He starts basically pounding on Abu Jahl UFC style. And so Abu Bukhtari, he was just beside himself with anger. He tried to talk reasonably with Abu Jahl, but Abu Jahl just continued to yell his head off and then even tried to throw a punch at Abu Bukhtari. And so this made him feel disrespected and then attack. Now, while this is happening, Hamza an is seeing this scene happen from the valley. He's seeing all this happen from the valley. And he knows what it feels like because he's beaten Abu Jahl before. He knows probably how good it feels. And so Hamza, seeing this, you know, because he is a companion of the Prophet Muhammad and there are always people that uphold truth and justice and do the right thing, Hamza gathered some of the other Muslim men and they ran to Abu Jahl and Abu Bukhtari and they actually ripped them apart, right? Hold me back, hold me back, right? So they actually uh, uh, broke up the fight. And in that moment, they actually saved Abu Jahl's life because there was no sign that Abu Bukhtari was going to stop. And they told Abu Bukhtari, you can leave. Your job is done. You can leave. Now, why though? Abu Jahl is an evil, cold-blooded man who has tortured and killed multiple Muslims in broad daylight. But still, Hamza and other Muslims stepped in to save Abu Jahl's life because if this man is killed, as vile as he is, he is still viewed as the leader of the Quraysh in Mecca. And even if Abu Bukhtari claims responsibility for Abu Jahl's death, it would backfire on the Muslims. Because Abu Jahl's death would have been taken place near the valley of the Muslims. So therefore, all the Muslims are responsible. And so the oppression and the vile, uh, um, you know, aggression against the Muslims would have continued and gotten even heavier. And more suffering would have rained down upon them. They would have found a way to blame the Muslims. So in an effort to not blame the Muslims further and to cause the oppression to become even more unbearable than it already is, Hamza Radha wisely decided that we're actually going to break this apart. And a lot of sacrifices have already been made by the Muslims. Abu Talib and the family of the Prophet Muhammad to keep the mushrikun at bay so that the message of Allah could still be propagated because that's the goal. At the end of the day, the goal is that the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches all four corners of the globe. And so if Abu Jahl is killed with the Muslims standing there, then nothing will stop the Quraysh from eliminating the Muslims completely. Now, Abu Jahl, obviously because he's Abu Jahl and the worst person this earth has probably ever seen, didn't care that these Muslims saved his life. And he still carried on being a jerk, to put it very mildly. Now, the general sentiment on the streets of Mecca was that the people didn't like what was going on in the Valley of Abu Talib. More and more people started becoming more and more sympathetic towards the suffering of Bani Abdul Muttalib and the Muslims. And so the Meccans, they talked amongst themselves at home or in the streets that this vile pact that we were forced to sign on to, this wretched vile pact. Okay, Tamam, where were we? So, we were forced on to side onto this vile pact that has caused such inhumane treatment of our neighbors. So now the Meccans, who had known these people their whole lives, they hated to see them suffering under this boycott. So there was kind of a, a turn against the leadership of Quraysh, a slow turn against the leadership of Quraysh. Every day, more and more people becoming sympathetic to the Muslims. Every day, more and more people wondering, what can we do? And so after three years, and everyone was frail and weak. Some non-Muslims had enough. There was about four or five of them that made a group. And it started with one who asked, how is it possible that we live in peace and some of our family members, our tribesmen, our friends, and people that we know are dying and are starving to death? Where is our honor? We have to stand up. It's a system of oppression. But they knew they couldn't do it alone. So. The first person to have this kind of internal rebellion against the Quraysh is a person by the name of Hisham ibn Amr al-Hashimi. And Hisham, he went to his friend Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah 
who was a member of the Maghzum clan, which is the clan of Abu Jahl. And so they're talking to one another and basically they say what? They say that Hisham is trying to convince Zuhair to join him in standing up. But Zuhair says, no, no, that's not enough. We can't just have the two of us. There needs to be more people. So they end up going finding a third and then they find a fourth and then one narration says they even actually found a fifth as well. And so five of them gather. And this, this is the plan. They come up with a plan the night before. Tomorrow, one of them is going to step up. They're all going to go to Mecca. They're all going to make tawaf around the Kaaba. And they're all going to be around the vicinity in separate places. And then one of them is going to step up and say that we're against what's going on. We want the boycott to be over. And then one by one, each person will come out and say the same thing. Right? So the person that stepped up and said the first word was a person by the name of Zama'a ibn al-Aswat, right? Or it can be pronounced Zama'a or Zuma'a, right? Zuma'a ibn al-Aswat or Zama'a ibn al-Aswat, he's the first person that stood up and uh, decided to speak on this matter. And then one by one, the four or five kept coming out in support of what he was saying, that we want this boycott to be over. And when this was happening, Abu Lahab caught on and he said, هذا أمر قضي بالليل. This, this is all pre-planned. I don't know what you guys are doing, but it's very obvious that you guys pre-planned this from the start. However, it didn't matter. The message was clear. The people are against what is happening. And so, because of these five, more and more people started to become more brave and brave and step up. And while this is happening, right, where the people of Quraysh inside the city are having turmoil and fighting against the leadership and, and yelling at the leadership and arguing with the leadership. What are you doing to our people? While this happening, something is also going on back at the camp of the Muslims. So now imagine, imagine we're in a movie, there's the scene, and then we're cutting scenes now, right? And now we're in a different scene where we're at the camp of the Muslims now in the Sha'ab of Abu Talib. Abu Talib, he went to the Prophet Muhammad and told him, you know, things are very bad. Starvation is getting worse and worse. And so Abu Talib said, I want to approach the Quraysh leadership and I want to negotiate with them. One narration tells us that the Prophet Muhammad made dua against the people of Quraysh to have a famine like the famine at the time of Yusuf alayhi salam in, in, in Egypt. And so because of that, that a dua was accepted and even the Quraysh started experiencing a famine. And so therefore they were more open to ending the boycott of the Muslims because they knew it was the dua of the Prophet Muhammad that caused this famine to happen. And so he says that this boycott is non-negotiable, but I have to do something. I can't watch women and children die like this. So that is when the Prophet Muhammad tells Abu Talib that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed me that the contract that they signed has been destroyed. Termites came and ate up the contract, and the only thing that remains is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember, this contract is tied up in a leather case. It's hung on inside the Kaaba. No one has gone in to touch it at all because people don't go inside the Kaaba. There's only very few people that have keys to enter inside the Kaaba. So no one is inside the Kaaba, and the Pro Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallam is saying, that termites have come and ate up the contract and the only thing that was left was the name of Allah that they put on the top of the contract, right? Remember, because the Quraysh did believe in Allah, right? They did have a concept of Allah. Their problem was shirk, not disbelief, right? So, Abu Talib asked the Prophet Muhammad was this revealed to you? And the Prophet says, yes. And so what does Abu Talib say? He says, then it must be true because you're never wrong. Right? You're never wrong. Your revelation is never wrong. Now Abu Talib, he went to the Quraysh with his sons and said, I have a proposal. Right? And so the Quraysh said, wait, you know, maybe he's coming to hand over the Prophet Muhammad now and yada, yada, yada. But Abu Talib, he reprimands them. He says, you guys blame Muhammad وسلم, for severing family relations, for causing problems in Mecca, for causing problems in your community. But what you people have done was worse than anything that anyone has ever done in my lifetime. 
You have left your own women and children, people that are related to you. Maybe not immediately, but the whole tribe of Quraysh is essentially related to one another. And you left them to starve. So don't you dare lecture me or Muhammad about family, about tribe, about community. You do not hold the moral ground here. I've been out there watching people die. You have no moral ground to speak on. I'm not here to hand Muhammad over to you on a silver platter. I will protect him to my last breath. I know he does not tell a lie. You know what he told me? He told me that Allah has sent down insects and uh, one narration about the incident says that the insects ate away any mention of good in the pact. So one narration, which is the more authentic one, says that, and probably the, the, the more accurate, it says that everything was eaten except the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another narration says that uh, uh, the name of Allah and anywhere where the name of the Prophet Muhammad was is what got eaten away. So essentially the pact was useless and it can be torn up and destroyed. Understood? Right? You understand? So there's a there's difference of, of, of narrations here. But the more common narration that is in most of the uh, books of Sirah is the one that we more commonly know, which is the whole contract was eaten up by termites, except for the name of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the top it said, Bismik Allahumma, right? So, he says, go take a look at it and bring the pact. And so these people were confident that it was still there, right? Because no, one, no one's touched it for three years. Who, who would, who, who's touched it? So Abu Talib, he goes and he calls Abu Jahl out in public. And so, of course, Abu Jahl cannot seem like a coward so he told someone to go ahead and bring the pack down from the Kaaba and they took it and when they open up the leather case the parchment is exactly as the Prophet Muhammad said it was completely destroyed and they found the Prophet Sadaqa Rasulullah he spoke the truth and Bismik Allahumma is the only thing that remains Abu Jahl obviously he takes it as an opportunity and he says ah this is more sihr more sihr from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but at this point even the other Quraysh leader, leaders who were originally on the Abu Jahl side said it is what it is. Whether it's magic or whether it's termites, the contract doesn't exist anymore. The boycott has to end right now. And so outside, when the people heard about this, they erupted and they were ecstatic that the uh, boycott had ended. Remember, most of these people are non-Muslims. Even they couldn't withstand to see the crimes that were happening against the Muslims. And so they tried to step up and do something about it. Right? And so this is very honorable. This is a very respectful thing. And it's something that we're seeing today as well. Alhamdulillah. There's a lot of non-Muslims around the world who are standing up for the people in Gaza. Standing up for the people in Yemen and Sudan and, and all over the globe. Because oppression is oppression at the end of the day. And people's hearts are inclined towards justice. Right? People's hearts are inclined towards justice and rahmah and mercy. Now, after that, Many of the, you know, common everyday Quraysh folks decided to go to Sha'ib Abi Talib, the valley, and get the Muslims back, and they escorted them individually back to their homes. Now, what convinced the high-caliber Quraysh leaders to break away from this boycott and go against Abu Jahl was that Abu Talib recited some poetry to appeal to the goodness and pride of the people there who had more decency than Abu Jahl. So he recited poetry, but he wasn't directing it at Abu Jahl. He was directing it at the other leaders. He said, Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, those guys are a lost cause. But you get, there's still some honor left in you guys. And so the Abu Talib, he recites, أَلَا أَبْلِغَ عَنِّي عَلَى ذَاتِ بَيْنِنَا لُؤَيِّنْ وَخُصَّ مِنْ لُؤَيِّنْ بَنِي كَعْبِ That I am here to reason about our relationship with Banu Ka'b. أَلَمْ تَعْلَمُ أَنَّ وَجَدَنَا مُحَمَّدًا نَبِيًّا كَمُوسَى خُطَّ فِي أَوَّلِ الْكُتْبِ Don't they understand that we have found Muhammad وسلم, to be truthful and to be a prophet like the prophets before him? When you read the poetry of Abu Talib, one of the most heartbreaking things about it is not just the, it's the beauty and the eloquence that he had, and the fact that he loved the Prophet Muhammad so much, but in his poetry, it becomes very clear that he knew the Prophet was speaking the truth, yet he still didn't accept the stand. And it breaks our hearts to see this. 
someone who's so beloved to the Prophet ﷺ, someone who loves the Prophet ﷺ so much, speak like this and say he's truthful like the other Prophets. Yet he still doesn't accept Islam himself. And I'll talk about it more in detail later because probably next week, uh, we're, we're talking about the timeline, next week is when, actually no spoilers, right? I know you guys probably already know, but no spoilers. Anyways, just so you guys can come back next week, inshallah. But the love of Abu Talib wasn't enough for him to enter paradise because submission to Allah still has to be there. And we can, I can confidently say, without a shadow of a doubt, right? And some of you guys might look at me funny for saying this, but I, I, I don't care. When I read the, the poetry of Abu Talib, I know this to be true. The love Abu Talib had for the Prophet Muhammad outweighs the love that all of us in the room have for him combined. Without a doubt. But again, that submission of Allah wasn't there. And that's the key. Because that's what Islam is. It's submission. Right? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. وَأَنَّ عَلَيْهِ فِي الْعِبَادِ مَحَبَّةً وَلَا خَيْرَ مِمَّنْ خَصَّهُ اللَّهُ بِالْحُبِّ Don't you see that Allah has showered upon the Prophet Muhammad the love of his fellow man and that there is no more good than someone who is given the love of Muhammad Allahu Akbar Look, he's saying that when you are given the love of the Prophet Muhammad there is nothing else in this world that is good anymore That's, that's all that's good That's all that's good وَأَنَّ الَّذِي أَلْسَقْتُمْ مِنْ كِتَابِكُمْ لَكُمْ كَائِنٌ نَحْسَ كَرَاغِيَةِ السَّقْبِ That don't they see and understand that this pact you have hung from the Kaaba is a huge source of shame and embarrassment for you. أَفِيقُوا أَفِيقُوا قَبْلَ أَيْ يُحْفَرَ الثَّرَى وَيُصْبِحَ مَنْ لَمْ يَجِنْ ذَنْبًا كَذِ الذَّنْبِ Rise above this, rise above this. He's telling them rise above it. Find your decency before the graves are dug and the innocent is buried as the guilty should not even be buried. And don't follow wild animals. Who's the wild animal? Right. Say it louder. Abu Jahl, yes. Wild animal Abu Jahl. Bismillah, we can say it, right? And don't break relationships after so much love and nearness has been established between us. There is a lifetime of love and history between these people before Abu Jahl decided to sow the seeds of disunity between us. Don't let him be that reason. You are being dragged into a battle that will never end. It will have multiple casualties. And you people have tasted the bitter milk of war before. So Abu Talib then he points at the Kaaba and he continues and he says, I swear by the Rabb of this bait that we will never hand over Ahmad. And remember Ahmad is what? the close family of the Prophet Muhammad would call him. Right? By calling him Ahmad, Abu Talib is letting the Quraysh know, excuse me, letting the Quraysh know that Muhammad is my boy. You think I'm going to just hand over my boy to you? So Abu Talib, he continues and he says, أَلَيْسَ أَبُونَ هَاشِمٌ شَدَّ أَزْرَهُ وَأَوْصَ بَنِيهِ بِالطِّعَانِ وَبِالدَّرْبِ So he reminds them and he says, isn't Hashim one of our forefathers. Didn't he work very hard to teach us to be good? He taught us about how serious war is. He also taught us about good ethics, but he also taught us how to fight. Basically, he's saying, I'm the grandson of Hashem. So Abu Talib is appealing to the Quraysh that war is serious and that they will have to bury their loved ones. But at the same time, Abu Talib is emphasizing that Hashem who is a very honorable, a very dignified man that has brought a lot of respect to the Quraysh and is his grandfather. Hashem was the leader that everyone will look up to and he is Abu Talib's grandfather. Abu Talib, he continues and he says, 
even despite all of that, we are not afraid of war. We are not afraid of fighting you. Fighting, we don't bore fighting. Fighting gets bored of us. I finish things, is what essentially Abu Talib is saying here. And this is a big thing for a man like Abu Talib to say, because he's a humble and gentle man. Right? So for him to step up and say this, it shows that Abu Jahl pushed it a little bit too far. Right? Maybe not a bit too far, a lot too far. And so that's why Abu Talib appealed to the senses of the rest of the Quraysh leaders. You may have started this entire thing, but Abu Talib will finish this. So Abu Talib, he says, وَلَا نَشْتَكِي مَا قَدْ يَنُوبُ مِنَ النَّكْبِ And I'm not here to beg and plead for my life. We were taught by our forefathers not to complain about difficulty. For three years, we have been listening to our children cry to sleep. For three years, we have been burying our dead, but we're not done. So you best take into consideration who you're picking a fight with. Even though we can finish things, know that we are people who pride ourselves in protecting our people. And the souls of the people who go out into the battlefield eventually leave the body. We're not afraid to fight. But we prefer to protect people instead. And so I, there, there's a time and place to use intelligence, and there's a time and place to fight people to the death. And we don't want to fight people to the death. That's not something that we're looking for. But if you want that to happen, just know we will be the ones to finish it. And so Abu Talib, he shouted this to the Quraysh leaders at, at the Haram. And so by the time Abu Talib was done, everyone heard enough. They took that boycott parchment from Abu Jahl's hands, and they tore it up. They got rid of it. And they said, we may not agree with the Prophet Muhammad but we are bringing our people back home. Right? And the boycott ended three years after it started. And everyone who stood with the Prophet Muhammad his family, both Muslims and non-Muslims, arrived back home to Mecca, and they got some relief from the suffering of the valley. Now, the Muslims are back in Mecca, and they're essentially back to square one because it was such a horrible trial for them now they need to reestablish you know their homes they need to reestablish their community their unity they need to reestablish so many things they need to recover from the past three years that have just happened right you know it's it's wallahi it's crazy because the, the harshness of the boycott that they had to deal with for three years for three years, they had to deal with this. I just explained these three years in one hour. And this is one of the injustices that everyone that has ever written a book of Sirah, that has ever taught a Sirah class, that has ever discussed a story of Sirah, does when it comes to the Sirah. You can't really true, do true justice to the pain and the suffering that the companions had to go through in order to have that opportunity of paradise. That sacrifice in order for Islam to reach all four corners of the globe. Remember those sacrifices. Next time our own Iman is tested, think about these stories and say what efforts had to take place for me to be a Muslim in Seattle, Washington. And for people to come to the masjid and accept Islam in Seattle, Washington. What had to happen in order for that to happen? This is what had to happen. Right? This is what had to happen. Now, the one who actually wrote the contract himself, right? The man who actually penned the agreement was someone by the name of Mansur ibn Ikrama. And when the Prophet Muhammad saw the suffering of his people, he was so pained by the adversity of the innocent that he made dua against whoever wrote something that vile as the boycott pact. And so shortly afterwards, Mansur's hands actually became paralyzed. And he was not able to use his hands for the rest of his life. Right? Now to ensure the safety of the Prophet Muhammad Abu Talib, he decided to take back from a volatile situation just as the Prophet employed the same strategy when he sent the 100 believers to Habasha. So even in these extreme circumstances, the lesson that we can adopt here is that even in extreme circumstances, as believers, we don't adopt a vengeful attitude. Everything is done through a system, and that system is Allah and His Messenger. Right? 
Even when they saw Abu Jahl being beaten to death, the Muslims, what, they, what did they do? They stepped in to actually save his life. And they did this so that there would not be any more problems down the road against the Muslims. Right? Now, why? Why did the miracle of the insects tearing away the pack not occur three years ago? When it could have been prevented. So many innocent deaths. Why did it not happen three years later after such a long time? As a matter of fact, the Muslims have witnessed miracle after miracle. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to awaken the population of Mecca. This is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to awaken the population of Mecca. And so now that they are more sympathetic to Islam, you're going to see them accepting Islam in droves now. A lot of them are going to be willing to hear the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa after now. Right? So Allah waiting until the general populace of Mecca was collectively awakened and not okay with this boycott, and then the boycott ended. Right? And so patience, you know, the biggest lesson we can derive from today's session is that patience is a major quality that is emphasized throughout the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But patience in our lives is something that, you know, is more, more than likely inevitable. We're going to have trials, we're going to have tests. Because as Muslims, we can't prove our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without tests. The Quran is, is riddled with verses like this. However, we don't ask for tests, right? The, the Prophet sallallahu told us, as uh, 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 Allah right? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ease. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for, uh, for, for comfort. Right? We don't ask for tests. But when tests come, right, we remember the Prophet ﷺ and his companions and the tests they faced. And uh, we remember that patience is a major quality in the life of a believing Muslim man or a Muslim woman. So we'll conclude here, inshallah. And the next week we will discuss some things about the aftermath of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, or of the boycott. And uh, right after, now we are, so we talked about three years in one hour. So we started, the boycott started in the seventh year of Nubuwa. And so three years later, it's what? The tenth year of Nubuwa, right? And so now in that tenth year of Nubuwa, there are some aftermath of the boycott. And then in that tenth, eleventh year of Nubuwa, there is a year called the Am al Huzd, right? The uh, year of grief of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we will talk about both of those things, inshallah ta'ala, next week. Any questions, Ya Jama'ah? Yes? I know that it's <coughs> understood that Abu Talib. Uh, like it's commonly understood that Abu Talib didn't die in Muslim. Yeah. yeah. But do we have? Uh, do we know for a fact that he did not die Muslim, or was it because of his last conversation with the Prophet that people then assumed that he didn't die in Muslim? So, uh, good question. So the question is. Uh, do we know for a fact that Abu Talib did not die a Muslim? Uh, or is it because of his last conversation with the Prophet Muhammad Or like, do we know that for a fact, right? That's the question essentially. Uh, the answer is yes, we do know for a fact because of the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj, which we'll talk about extensively in detail, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad actually saw the punishment of Abu Talib, right? He witnessed the punishment of Abu Talib. This is a narration of Sahih Bukhari, also found in Sahih Muslim. Uh, it actually saw the punishment that is going to occur to Abu Talib. So, therefore, we know that it is for certain, right? It is for certain. Um, with that being said, right, there are actually uh, non Sunni beliefs that say that he accepted Islam, right? Just fun fact, if that's of interest to you. Yes. For like context or of like the picture, like so we know Quraysh is this like big tribe. Mm -hmm. like, what portion of it is like Ben and Hashem? Like because you said they're family, you said they're part of each other. Like is it? Like, yeah. yeah. Aren't, if they're a big portion, how do you just boycott? Like so, imagine like immediate family members and then like extended family, right? And so when it comes to immediate family members and extended family, like your your first cousins, your first uncle your first uh, aunt or, or, and things like that, those will probably be the ones who are under your tribe, right? Once you get to the second and third, right, those are people are part of other tribes, right? But then eventually, like, all of Quraysh in one way or another is kind of related to uh, one another, right? Like, uh, you can find someone who says, oh, my wife's 
uncle's nephew is related to this person, right? So then it's like everybody's kind of, they know each other and they know their relation with each other. And plus there wasn't, there's not a lot of people in that area, right? There's like, there's maybe like a thousand or maybe a, a, a few, like a few thousand or some, something that are there in, in, in that tribe. So everybody knows everybody, right? So there's that kind of idea of also family in that way because every, everybody will look after one another as well in, in that sense. Um, and, you know, uh, the reason why Islam came was because uh, even despite tribal ties, people were, uh, you know, oppressing one another and people were um, trying to take leadership from one another and those who were rich were continuing to become more rich and those who were poor would be con were continuing to become more poor and a lot of imbalance in, in society, uh, just like we see today. You know, I always say that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu came to progress the darkest society that we've ever seen from indecency, from interest, from uh, uh, lewdness, from vulgarity, right? And so we progressed out of that. And now today we see all these things coming back in the name of progression when in actuality it's regression. Because that's what the Prophet ﷺ came to get rid of, not establish, right? So the progress already happened. Now you guys are regressing again, right? Wallahu um, alam. Right, so does that kind of ex explain it a little bit? Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, I see a question online here. Let me see. <coughs> Uh, someone's asking, were there any verses of the Qur'an that were revealed during the boycott? Good question. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Surah Al-Ahqaf was revealed during this time. So the entirety of that Surah was revealed during those three years. Any questions from the sisters? No? Good? Okay. Jazakallah khair. Uh, a couple announcements, inshallah. So first of all, I'm sure uh, just I'm sure some of you guys have seen the announcement for our fiqh of zakat and our fiqh of fasting class. So our fiqh of fasting class, these are important because we want to make sure that these the these pillars of ibadah that we're about to engage in in, in just a short few weeks, uh, we are doing them correctly and in a way that is most pleasing to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So our fiqh of fasting class to talk about the intricacies of fasting, right? Uh, this class will not be focused on spiritual elements, will only be focused on the, the, the fiqh, the law elements, right? Spiritual elements, inshallah ta'ala, we will be discussing more in our night at the masjid, in our khutbahs, in our uh, isha khatiras, and things like that, right? But for this class specifically, for, for this purpose, in order, because of the time is short, we want to cover the the, the matters of law retaining to fiqh of fasting. So that's going to be Thursday, February 29th at 7.30 p.m., right? At 7.30 p.m. So we'll basically pray. We'll start it right after Isha Salah, inshallah. Uh, fiqh of zakat will be Friday, March 8th. Friday, March 8th at 7.30 p.m. Also going to be uh, right after Isha Salah, inshallah ta'ala. Now, the other announcement is that we are looking for Ramadan volunteers. We need a lot of volunteers for Ramadan. If you guys were here in Ramadan last year, and alhamdulillah, most of the time things were ran smoothly. Uh, and even if things weren't running smoothly, the volunteers did a good job of pretending like things were running smoothly. So people didn't know things weren't running smoothly, right? Um, so that required a lot of effort from volunteers, right? And so I, you know, one special thing is um, we're constantly making dua for you, right? In the month of Ramadan, me personally and all the people that are reciting in Tarawih and all the people that are doing the, 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 the khunut and the tahajjud and, and everything, we're making personal dua for you as much as we can for the volunteers. And there's a lot of dua, a lot of potential reward, inshallah ta'ala, for that opportunity. So if you're interested in becoming a volunteer for Ramadan, if you're a brother, you can reach out to either Abdul Hadi or Abdul Rahman Basyuni, right? And if you are a sister, you can reach out to Sister Kawthar, inshallah ta'ala, and tell them you are interested. Or, sorry? Or Maya, Sister Maya. Either Sister Maya or Sister Kothar. You can reach out to them, inshallah, and uh, they will help you sign up for the volunteer opportunities, inshallah. Okay, with that being said, Jazakallah khair. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati ama yasifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.